Okay, thank you for the, for the introduction and uh, welcome to you all uh, for being here. Um, yeah, as you realize, this is a summer school about machine learning. Um, and as Luca explained in great length, uh, you need data to learn something from, right? Uh, and therefore data management is like an integral component to this, like somehow we need to get this data. Uh, and even if you have this data, you have to organize it somehow uh, to make it available to your machine learning models and whatnot. So therefore I want to talk about uh, uh, data management a little bit. Um, I structured this whole talk into, into basically like three, three pieces. Um, the, the first piece is rather short. It's more like a very, very rough introduction. And then there are three more detailed pieces. Um, first, I want to explain a little bit what is versus research data management, like in a very broad sense in, 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 in general. Uh, and then we will look at a very specific tool, which is Nomad, uh, uh, which you can use to, to manage your own research data uh, or work with the research data that others, others have provided on this platform. Um, and then there's a part on modeling data, um, which is rather important because data in itself, just numbers, right? Doesn't really mean much to you. You need to organize it uh, somewhat. Uh, and data modeling is a very important aspect of this one. Um, this is both for yourself, like to model your own data, but also to understand how others have modeled their data to, to just get some meaning out of uh, the information that they provide. Um, and then the last part would be working with APIs, right? Very, very typically, you're not working with your own data. You're using data from, from, from others uh, that are also on databases and whatnot. Uh, and very often you will have some kind of programming interface that you can use with these databases uh, to access the data that they provide. And maybe even in the long run, you also want to provide your data to others. Uh, might even be get into the problem of programming an API by yourself. So um, yeah, these are the four, thing, uh, four things that I think are, are important uh, aspects of data management, especially when you think about it from a machine learning perspective. Okay, let's, let's jump into the, into the first uh, topic. Uh, research, uh, research data management, which is a very broad term. Uh, I, I guess you heard about it because like maybe, maybe your bosses are, are requiring you to do certain steps uh, to organize your data um, or whether you heard of, uh, about it in general from, from um, yeah, when you are applying for funding or stuff like this, people are suddenly asking you to write research data management plans and stuff like this. Um, so let's have, a, let's have a small look into what research, research data management might be. Um, there are obviously lots of definitions and different goals and activities around this, uh, as this is a very broad uh, term. Let's start with a very simple definition. Uh, research data management is a process of organizing, preserving, and sharing research data throughout its life cycle. Uh, the thing that I find very important here is the, the, the life cycle aspect, right? It's not just uh, keeping, uh, keeping data um, um, in one point in time, so it's really following the data along uh, how it's, uh, how it's, yeah, how it's uh, acquired and then how you, how, you, how you deal with it, how you analyze it, how you refine it, you augment it, and then so on and so forth. Like, typically it's a whole workflow. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, this puts very much emphasis on metadata, but which we will see later is, is a rather important aspect um, of describing your data. And then, of course, research data management has goals, right? The, the goals typically include stuff like uh, ensuring the re reliability, the integrity, the accessibility of research data uh, for yourself, for current use, but also for others, like for the generations after you, for, 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 uh, for the future use. Um, and research data management might entail certain, certain activities. Um, for example, planning the, the collection of data, documenting uh, how you came to the data, documenting the data itself, uh, implementing data storage systems, uh, backing your data up, uh, or developing policies and procedures for sharing and preserving the data in the long run, and all these kinds of things. Um, the importance of research data management is, is, is uh, yeah, it's also twofold, uh, many folds, right? It's, it's about the ensuring of the quality of data, it's ensuring the re reusability of data, the preservation of data. Uh, and everything to support scientific discovery and validation. So as you see, that's very, very broad stuff that you might read on a Wikipedia page or that maybe an artificial intelligence is feeding you when you're asking, uh, asking it about what is research data management. Um, let's try to dig a little bit deeper and make this more focused about, about us. Um, depending on who you are and, and, and how you're looking on this, there, there might be different perspectives to this, right? Uh, so you might either be an individual researcher and, 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 and have uh, an interest in research data management from this perspective, or you represent a lot large, larger institutions, let's say you are an institute director or a group leader or something like this, um, or you think about the research community at large. And depending on which perspective you, you are in, uh, research data management looks a little bit different, right? 
Uh, starting with the community at large, uh, it might be more about uh, finding data, making data accessible, making data, making data interoperable uh, and reusable. You're looking at these FAIR principles, uh, with, with, which we and Fairmart are, are, are stressing quite a lot. That's why Fairmart is called uh, uh, Fairmart. We will see it later. Um, yeah, and here the, the, the idea is um, that data should become something like paper publications, right? In the same way that you try to proliferate information in traditional paper publications, data should work in a similar way, right? You should publish your data. Others should be able to learn from your data and use your data. Um, this is like the, the, the community view. And for the community, it's mostly important to develop standards for data, right? So that everybody gets data in the same way, uh, uses data in the same way, publishes this data in the same way. When you look at it from an institute perspective, it changes a little bit. Like the, the, the main goal of the institute might be to see data as an investment, right? You, you're, you're putting up money, you're hiring people, you're, you're, you're financing instruments and whatnot, um, and, and they produce data. And this is basically your investment, right? Uh, that has then like a big angle is like all this intellectual property that might be tied to, uh, to, to your data. And therefore, institutes are interested, interested in having policies uh, and also uh, uh, delivering the resources that are necessary uh, to manage this data, right, to preserve this investment. And then there's you as an individual researcher. Um, and here it's more practical, right? It's really about, okay, you, you're acquiring data, you're doing experiments, uh, or you, you need to organize your work, you need to organize your data, you need to prepare your data for analysis, right? You want to learn something from your data. Uh, and of course, you want to have smooth collaboration with others, which also might include uh, might include uh, data. So and as, a, as a researcher, you're more interested in having the right tools to organize your data, to manage your data. Uh, and ideally, these tools uh, will simplify and unify your work with, with data so that you don't have to invent it every time uh, uh, from scratch. Okay, uh, I, I said like for you as an individual, it's mostly about tools. What 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 are typical tools for for research data management? Uh, in a more traditional sense, or in a more, in, in a more uh, as, as a starting point, so to speak, uh, uh, research data management might be very simple things, right? It might be using a file system to organize your stuff in fair files, right? Or using a backup system to make sure uh, that your data isn't isn't getting lost, right? Or it might be very simple data documentation and annotation tools. Uh, for example, you might use Excel to put your numbers and in, 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 in columns and tables and put headers on it and stuff like this. Uh, it might also be tools for data visualization, right? You have lots of numbers and you want to understand them somehow, so you want to visualize them. You want to put them in charts and plot them and whatnot. Uh, other tools might include simple scripting and programming languages, right? You use programs to, uh, um, to, to analyze your data, to modify your data, transform the data, to visualize your data and whatnot. Um, other tools might be databases, right? If your data gets a little bit more complex and you need more, 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 more insight, and, and, and uh, then you might turn to, to databases to organize your data and structure your data a little bit better. Although these are very, very typical tools. Like if, if, you, if no one gives you a very special tool for your domain, you would use something like this or a combination of these tools to work with data. But then, of course, there are also specialized tools. And in the domain of material science, these might be tools like this, right? Uh, there might be something like Nomad. Uh, as we will later learn, which is basically a web-based platform that you can use to organize your data, publish your data, and share it with others. Uh, or it might be stuff like electronic lab notebooks, uh, little pieces of software that allow you to, to document your experiments uh, and the data that you acquire during your experiments, uh, or laboratory information management systems, uh, where it's more about like, controlling instruments and getting data directly from your instruments and, and, and curating all these kind of things. Uh, or maybe stuff like data repositories, stuff like Zenodo, for example, right? Things where you can then finally publish your, uh, publish information, where you can go to find the information from, uh, of others, uh, and so on and so forth. Getting back to, uh, and, and trying to relating these these kind of tools uh, to the to the three different perspectives that we saw on the last slide. Um, the idea of these tools is that they are developed by communities, right? Communities again uh, are interested in, in creating standards, so it makes sense for a community. To produce tools, right? So, not, not do not write the tool for yourself. Write the tool for every, everybody, uh, and then hopefully in the community uh, we will arrive at certain tools that everybody uses, uh, and then that, that they that these tools uh, provide uh, the, the respective standards. Um, from an institute's perspective, of course, you have to offer these tools, right? You you have to like run these tools. You have to offer these tools to your to your 
to your employees, to your students, uh, and so and so on and so on and so forth. So basically, these tools are the resources that they that they should provide, and also these tools can be used to implement the policies uh, that that uh, certain institutions. Uh, um, um, produce to follow their idea of research data management. And then, of course, you as the individual researcher, you are the users of these tools, right? Um, these tools should help you in your day-to-day -day research work. Okay, that was my little, little uh, introduction to, to research data management. Um, just that you heard of it as an abstract term. Uh, and I think for the, for, the, for the rest of the lecture, we will basically be, will be focusing on this perspective of the uh, individual researcher uh, and looking at a few tools. Uh, and the next thing uh, in particular is the tool that uh, we are developing here, which is called Nomad. Um, and yeah, I will spend the next roughly 25 minutes or something um, on this. Let's start with a very rough uh, introduction about where is Nomad coming from or who's building Nomad and, and, and why are we building Nomad and so on and so forth. Um, I have this little slide here, which tries to explain a little bit our project structure and where our money is coming from and how we finance the development of Nomad. So the outer shell that you see here, the, the, the gray stuff, uh, is the, the NFDI, uh, so the, the, the German abbreviation for Nationale Forschungsdateninfrastruktur. I think you could translate this into National Research Data Infrastructure, um, which is basically an initiative by our government uh, to give us researchers some money to organize our data. Um, and it's structured in a way um, that the uh, that uh, I think the federal government and uh, uh, also the also the, the, the individual states uh, they are giving some money to the to the DFG to the German Research Society Deutsche Forschungsgesellschaft and I don't know how, how to translate this better into into English. Um, they gave them lots of money and they are then thought about how how, how do we organize this how do we distribute the money. Uh, and in principle, there are different approaches to do this, and they decided on doing a bottom-up approach. Like and instead of saying, okay, this is how we, Germany is supposed to do research data management, they said, let's go into the individual communities and let them figure this out by themselves. Uh, so what they did is they basically asked the scientists to form consortia, uh, and, and these consortia are supposed to represent a smaller part of the uh, of the scientific world. Uh, so there are now, I think, uh, uh, over over two dozens of these consortia that represent different aspects uh, or different different domains of science. Uh, and Fermat, which is our consortium, we are representing the solid state physics flavor of material science, uh, so to speak, uh, in this research uh, landscape. So Fermat, the acronym is in, is in uh, yeah. Um, basically consists of FAIR, uh, which is this uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, like the core, core set of principles of what we, what properties we like to have for our data, uh, and then MAT, MAT for, for material science, right, for, for material uh, in the name. Um, and then what FAMAT is doing, or how we organize FAMAT, um, is uh, at the core, we are building a tool, right, and this tool is called NOMAD. Uh, and Nomad is a web-based service, uh, or it's a software and, and, and business software with a web-based service uh, that everybody can use to manage their material science data. Uh, you can upload data to it, you can share data with others on it, uh, and you can, of course, also find the data of others there uh, and use this data for your machine learning, for example. Um, our consortium comes with a, with a set of yeah, uh, let, let, let's call them values. Um, one thing I already mentioned is, is, is this kind of fair, right? We want our data to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, findable and accessible usually makes a lot of sense to people, right? In order to, to have to do something with, with, with data that others provide, you need to be able to identify it uh, and you need to be able to access it. Uh, 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 like, for example, download it. For, uh, yeah. uh, the other tools are a little bit more difficult uh, to explain and also more difficult to achieve. Uh, one is interoperability, um, which could be interpreted as like, imagine you get data from different sources uh, about slightly different things. Can you use them together, right? Are they, uh, are, are they comparable? What do, you need, what do I need to do to make them interoperable or to interp interpret them in the same context? Um, this is certainly, uh, certainly a big challenge, uh, as we might see later in, in the talk, or which we will might later uh, explore during doing this, this, this whole uh, winter school here. Uh, and then, of course, there's this reusable, uh, which I think it's easy to, to, to explain what it means, but it's really hard to achieve, right? 
um, you find some piece of data and then it, the data should also explain to you how it was created, how, why it's there, uh, how it came to be. And ideally you should be able to re, re, reproduce this process, um, which might be very, very hard. But in Fermat, we strive to build the tools in a way that all these kind of uh, four core principles uh, can, be, can be fulfilled. Um, yeah, then of course, a very important aspect is, that, uh, is the, the whole open access uh, a, a, a topic. So what we, what we do, we try to do in a public space. Everybody can see what we do. Everybody can participate. Uh, and of course, the tools that we produce are supposed to be uh, for everyone. So everything has like the open source license attached to it. Uh, the platform nomads and, and the, the service that we provide is also open access. Everybody can use it. Everybody can publish the data. Everybody can access the data uh, of others with the lowest amount of barriers uh, that, that we can technically uh, think of. And then the last aspect of Fermat, or the last core value, is uh, that we are following uh, a, a bottom-up approach. Uh, and what, what I mean here with bottom-up is that what we are not doing is we are not sitting together like a, a handful of people that they are now devising just the standards that we then ask everybody to fulfill or to, to, to adhere to. Uh, it's more that we try to look at the existing ecosystem of tools, uh, of, 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 of machines, of instruments, uh, of simulations and whatnot. Uh, and that we try to deal with the data, the different types of data that might come, come out of these, these, these diverse, uh, uh, diverse landscape. Um, so we will later see uh, Fermat is a lot about understanding all kinds of different data formats, allowing you to come up with your own data formats and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, a little bit of insight in how we operate uh, 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 within, uh, within Fermat. Um, there's basically this kind of organization in different areas, like the, the, the different pies here in, 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 this, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this figure. Uh, and, and, and one pie uh, in particular is about uh, the data infrastructure where we build all the tools, right? This is, this is where all the developers are sitting uh, and, 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 and figuring out how normal should look like. Uh, and then we have different areas that come from different branches of material science that try to to use these tools and on, and, and go to uh, to go to our project partners and, and figure out how to use these tools and how to make them better for the researchers working there. And this is like uh, split up a little bit into material synthesis, into uh, uh, experiments, uh, uh, and into uh, the computational realm. Uh, and of course, we also have a section on on on, on certain use cases where we try to combine all these uh, these three different uh, these three different areas. Um, NOMAD itself has a very strong history uh, coming from the computational sector, so it was there before Fermat, it's like already existing since 2014, uh, when the first uh, simulation results were curated in a, in a, in a, in a public repository. Uh, so most of the data that we will see today uh, in, in, in demos and that we, uh, you might use uh, from there on in, in, in your machine learning is coming uh, from, from computations. Uh, but a big aspect of Fermat is to expand this view and also make the same tools and the same methodology available to, to, to data that comes from these other, uh, these other branches. Yeah, and then again, uh, uh, Nomad is uh, the tool that we try to build. Um, and um, yeah, to adhere the, 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 the grander idea of building a data infrastructure for Germany, uh, we also, uh, we are not just try to build a good tool for individual researchers to, to, to manage the data with, uh, we also try to do it in a way that it's scalable uh, so that, that uh, uh, um, yeah, we, we can work with a lot of data. Uh, and the approach to this is that we try to do this in a, in a federated uh, sense. Uh, so the normal software is also available to research institutions uh, or, or even to individuals to install and run this uh, themselves. So if you are representing a research group, for example, you might decide, okay, this normal tool uh, looks kind of interesting. Uh, I also, also, also want to have this for myself. Uh, so it's not just a web service uh, that you find on the internet. You can also run this uh, for yourself. Uh, for example, to customize this to your need uh, or to manage your data in a more private setting uh, before you are ready to publish your data uh, or to more tightly integrate this with the instrument in your laboratory and all, all kinds of uh, uh, things. So NOMAD is basically two things. It's a piece of software that you can use uh, uh, to manage the data in your, in your institute, in your group, um, but it's also a public web service that you can use to publish your data. Um, this is the team uh, uh, behind Fermat, um, um, just to give you, an, uh, that you get an idea about the scale of the project. 
Um, the people with the blue dots on here are the developers of, of, the, of the Nomad uh, software. Um, the people with the red dots are, are all uh, um, employees of Fermat um, that are trying to yeah, work as consultants, go to research partners, try to explain, uh, make them understand what Nomad is and, and how useful it is to, to them uh, and, and then make them use it. Um, um, and as you will probably see in your career, this whole digitization and, 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 and uh, making everybody in science understand that research data management is an important aspect uh, is a process uh, and we are just in the middle of it. Uh, so we still have to do lots of explaining and convincing and, and, and all these kind of things. Everybody without a dot on it uh, is, is typically a PI on the project. Uh, as you can imagine, a project of this size uh, has, a, has a lot of them. Um, Okay, let's go a little bit away from uh, from Fermat and and and, and the whole the, the whole background, uh, and turn a little bit more towards uh, the actual problem, uh, um, and, and start with the data. Um, and data comes in different forms, as you as you might know. Um, for example, data can be totally unstructured and not digital, right? You might uh, have it on a piece of paper or just in your head. Um, this is a screenshot of a. Of an old lab notebook, uh, uh, I guess I'm not even sure what what it's saying there, but it's about I don't know something biology, I would say. Um, but I think also in your field, you might have uh, you might have encountered very similar things. Of course, um, when we when we think about data, we typically think about digital data. We want to put them into machine learning algorithms, so they need to end up in the computer somehow. Uh, so the first step is to think about digital data which might still be unstructured, right? Uh, you can just take the, the, the experience of writing on paper and put it on a computer uh, with tools like Microsoft Notes or whatever you see here uh, in, in, in the background, right? Um, it is digital now, uh, but still without any, any human input, it's really hard to, to understand because it's still just text and bullet points and uh, little snippets of tables that might contain numbers. Um, so for a machine, uh, it will be really hard to do something with it. Now, the next step might be that you want to structure your data. Uh, then we call it, then it's digital data and it's structured data. Uh, one means to structure data, for example, would be tables, right? You use a tool like Excel and then you organize your data into, into, into tables. Um, and then they have some structure. You have columns, you have rows. Uh, on your column headers, you might tell what uh, this is by name. Maybe you give it a new a unit or some, something like this. Uh, and then in the in the various uh, then the various rows might represent certain experiments, certain measurements, whatnot. Uh, and then you put the numbers in them. Um, this becomes a little bit more useful for for machines, right? Or, or you you can take this, you can turn it into a CSV file, you can take some Python scripts, uh, load up this table data, and, and do something uh, something with it. So you're, you're heading in the right direction, and it's somewhat prepared for for doing machine learning on it. Uh, provided that you are very consistent with your table, right? That, that when you put in the numbers, you really adhere to the units that you that you uh, put in the in the table columns, uh, and that you uh, are very consistent in providing these these uh, these numbers. Um, another step would be, or, or, or another thing that you can do on top of it, uh, is you can write a schema for your data. You can basically predefine a contract where you say. My data is structured in this and that way, right? So uh, it's a little bit stronger than the Excel table where you're just uh, uh, writing down uh, this column is supposed to represent temperature and the unit I want to use is, is Kelvin. Uh, in the schema, you would formalize this a little bit more. Right? You would really say, I have these and these properties. Uh, 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 you give them a name. You might give aliases to the names. You might give a lengthy description about uh, how this property is supposed to be acquired or was acquired. Uh, you might define down the unit. Uh, you might find, define the shape of, of, uh, of a certain quantity, like whether it's just a number or whether it's like an array or a matrix or whatnot. Um, so you are a little bit more detailed in what you would do in, in an Excel table. Uh, and then the idea is that these schema, uh, schemas are formal enough so that you can derive tools from them that will force you to, it, to be consistent, right? That, that will basically tell you, uh, you have to put in a number here and it's supposed to be a number and not a number with a string attached or, or I don't know, what, what, whatever you might do in your, in your Excel tables. Um, it might remind you on what units to use and so on and so forth. This is a little bit the approach that we, that we use in Nomad. So what you see here is, is, is basically a screenshot from Nomad uh, where you see uh, a, a form that was uh, 
derived from a schema. So someone was sitting down and, and was deciding what this form was supposed to look like. And then the idea is that everybody using this will enter the data in a very consistent way. <clears throat> okay, this is what I wanted to say to the different, let's say the different types of data, right? Uh, 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 and of course, when you think about machine learning, you're more thriving towards the, 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 later, the later end of, uh, of what I was just describing. Um, now I wanted to jump a little bit into Nomad itself. Um, so I could probably talk hours about how Nomad is constructed and, and how it's working, working internally, but I guess the best approach is to just show it to you and, and, and demonstrate a few things. Uh, I, I have some screenshots here, which I, I guess are useful if you later stumble upon these slides. Um, but right now in this, this live kind of thing, I can also jump into the, into the normal software directly. Let me try to find my prepared thing here. Yeah, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Uh, I try to press the plus button until you stop squinting in the last rows. Is this okay for you? Yeah, okay. Um, so Nomad, the Nomad software has different views to it. Uh, you can publish data on it. Uh, this is the space where you manage your own data. Uh, and then at some point you say, okay, this is, this is, this is cool. I want to share this with others. Uh, and then you can publish it here. Um, we might have a look at this later on. Uh, then you have this whole uh, uh, area uh, uh, in the Nomad software where it's all about exploring the data that's already available. This is what we, what we will look at first. Uh, and then there's um, yeah, another category that's about analyzing the data, where we are talking about accessing the data via API, uh, where you might get access to, 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 to Jupyter notebooks uh, that you can use. Uh, I think we will use them later on in the, in the, in the, in the practical hands-on uh, thing. Um, yeah, so let me start with the explore section, which is typically when you think about machine learning and finding data for your, for, for your, for your models, uh, the, the first thing that you want to go to. Um, this is what the Nomad search interface looks like. Um, it already presents you with a list of search results uh, and you can press load more, load more, load more and, and so on uh, until you ex basically ex exhaust all the 12 million kind of uh, calculation results that are currently uh, in Nomad. Uh, of course, 12, 12 million is quite a large number. And as uh, Luca was pointing out, there might be a lot, uh, but typically you're only interested in a very small uh, 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 yeah, subdomain uh, of this. Um, so we provide lots of kind of filtering options to search through, through this data. So here on the left, you see our, our filter menu. Um, so this is basically uh, yeah, yeah, different aspects that you can filter for. And then if you click on these, these menus, you get uh, the actual specific, uh, the actual specific uh, filters uh, behind this. Um, yeah, and where, where do we start? Like typically, it's a good idea to start with the, with the, periodic, uh, with the periodic table, um, which I guess is the most familiar to, 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 to all of you. Um, this is like one possible filter that you can use on the normal database. And here you can filter for certain elements that you want to be uh, a part of your simulation, for example. Uh, so you can, you can start clicking these elements. And what's basically happening in the background is that this list here becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Right, so now we, do, we reduced it from 12 million to, to just 2, uh, 2 million uh, by saying, I want to have only simulations that somehow contain oxygen as, a, as an element uh, in the simulated system. And then you can go, go on uh, and, and, and continue to do so. Uh, you might see that the, the colors, uh, the colors of the elements is slightly, uh, slightly changing. Uh, what we are trying to do here is to use this, uh, uh, the, the periodic table as a, as a heat map. Uh, to show you a little bit uh, what is left in the remaining set and how that might be distributed uh, among the the remaining uh, the remaining the remaining elements. So if I if I if I keep selecting here, it becomes more and more extreme, right? Uh, to the point where you see, okay, uh, now they are. If I collect all three of them and say I'm only interested in, in, in compositions that contain all these three elements, uh, and then the remaining calculations. Uh, uh, might still be about compositions that contain additional elements, but the, 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 the possible elements become less and less. Um, and this is true for all the filters uh, uh, that, you, that you will find here. Um, we are basically uh, always trying to give you statistics that are about the remaining data, right? Uh, applying a filter and then showing you um, how, the, uh, how the remaining data is, is distributed. Uh, here, for example, we see like certain symmetry classes and, and, and how they uh, might be distributed about the uh, on the remaining uh, the remaining calculations, and every time you you add a filter, of course, these kind of statistics change. 
uh, because you change the set uh, that these uh, statistics are about. And then you can use this filter system um, yeah, to basically boil down the 12 million calculations towards something that, uh, that you might be interested in. Um, and we are basically providing filters uh, about the, yeah, uh, about the, uh, the, the simulated materials, stuff like elements, uh, formula, uh, uh, symmetry classes, uh, and so on. Uh, we have filters about the scientific method that was used to produce the information. Um, as I said, historically, uh, it's mostly about uh, simulations, uh, DFT simulations, uh, and, and so on. And we are slowly trying to expand this towards more stuff that comes from, uh, from experiments, which is one of the main goals of FAMAT, uh, opening this up for uh, other types of, uh, of data. Uh, and then beyond the scientific method, you can also uh, uh, filter for certain, yeah, uh, uh, properties that might be the result of these, these calculations, uh, for example. Uh, if you want to see uh, materials that, or calculations that have a that have a density of states with them, or that have a band structure, if you're interested in this kind of information, uh, you can also use this uh, use this as a filter. Uh, uh, let me let me click them click them both here, um, and then if I go to the the results, so now I filtered for titanium and oxi oxygen, and, and they said I want to have a band structure and the density of states in my data. Uh, now, if I click on one of the result entries, so there are only 42 remaining now, uh, I should be able to actually see, first of all, the simulated material. Um, and then if everything uh, is working correctly, I should also see like the, uh, yeah, the simulated uh, results of event structure and, 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 the, and the density of states. Um, this is basically our preview layer. So for all the simulations or later on experiments and whatnot uh, that have been entered into NOMAD, we try to provide an overview that gives you an idea what, the, what this is about, what kind of information you might, uh, might find in here. Um, but to this overview, there is also always uh, a more detailed view that shows you the, uh, uh, the data uh, in, in all its entirety. Uh, and what we see here is basically that the data on NOMAD is coming in this hierarchical structure uh, it's basically, it's a little bit like a file browser. Uh, so uh, this, this thing here, this first lane represents the whole data entry. Uh, and then we see always these kind of sections and then there are subsections to it and it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, in this example, it's a simulation run. So that's why we have the section run here, for example. And then you can see the simulation run is consisting uh, about information about the used program. Here we see it's a vast calculation uh, that was done with a certain vast version and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a section that details the electronic, uh, the, 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 the method that was used, like the different parameters that went into the, uh, went into the, the calculation. For example, you will find information about what function it's were used and so on and so forth. Um, then we have information on the, uh, on the system that was simulated. Uh, this is uh, where you then also get the information or the data that, that was used to produce this, this kind of preview. Uh, if, you, if you look a little bit deeper here, uh, the system is typically um, yeah, represented by giving a set of lattice vectors, uh, by giving element positions, and then giving species to these elements. Um, Exactly, and then it goes on and on, though there we have something about the system, and then of course we have also something about the, the, the calculation results, uh, and here you will then find, for example, the density of states or the, or the band structure. Uh, what specifically you might find in these, uh, in, in, in these entries uh, really depends on what was done uh, in, in, in terms of um, what kind of instrument was used, what kind of simulator was used to, uh, to produce this data. Uh, the important aspect here is that everything that you see has the structure to it, uh, and that everything that, that you see uh, has a schema attached uh, with it, right? So it's basically like a giant exit table uh, where we are very specific about what we put in our uh, column uh, headers. Okay, maybe we use this as a, uh, a stop here for, for, for the first demo uh, of what we, what we have in Nomad, we might see more uh, in the future, um, yeah. But the important aspect that, that I want you to uh, want to, wanted to communicate to you is that there is this web service that you can use uh, to go through a lot of simulations uh, and find some data that you might use for uh, your machine learning experiments. And that, that this data is highly structured, uh, and every piece of information comes with a schema. <clears throat> 
Okay, now let me let me jump back to the, the, the presentation mode. Um, Of course, I skipped the screenshots now. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit of explanation what, what is happening uh, 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 under the hood of, of, of Nomad. Um, all the information, all the data that, that you saw was, uh, uh, when, when you think about it in terms of um, computer simulations, for example, was at some point uploaded by someone, right? It was, was put into the database. We were, we were never really doing our own calculations or something like this. Uh, so all the all the calculations are, are basically provided, uh, and what you can do is you can just if you if you've done the simulation you can just upload it to Nomad, um, and uploading basically means you take you take the files that you have right you you run your simulation you get you have some input files you have some output files you just zip it up uh, and you you upload this to uh, this to Nomad uh, for example this might be a vast calculation and you might have files like this right. Uh, then once you have put this into Nomad, Nomad is going through your files and it's trying to identify what of these files that you gave me do I understand? What, what, what of these files follow a format that, that, I, that I support? Um, and this means uh, we have a, a set of parsers. Um, there are over 50 parsers in Nomad that understand different uh, uh, simulation uh, programs uh, or different instruments and, and whatnot uh, that understand different data formats. Uh, and once we find uh, a parser for your file, the parser is run. And what the parser is basically doing is taking the information from your file in a particular format, and it's translating it into, into a, a, a more canonical, more standard kind of format. And this is our built-in uh, built uh, data representation that you just saw in, in, in the demonstration, right? this hierarchical uh, kind of organization of data. So this is what, what all our parsers are doing. They are going through your simulations and they are producing this hierarchy of information uh, according to, to our predefined schema. Uh, and the same method might be applied to data that is coming from an instrument. Uh, for example, there might be a Nexus file that is coming out of uh, some kind of microscope, for example. Yeah, there would also be uh, some parser that is trying to interpret the Nexus file and read all the information about the use instrument, the use sample, and, and so on and so forth. And then this process data, this, this, this structured data, which is like uh, based on our uh, on our built-in system, is then the basis for all other for all kinds of different functionality that we built around it. Right? Uh, this uh, then allows us to create a search index, for example, like all the search filters that you are that you could 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 create. Uh, they are basically searching for data that was first passed out of uh, data that was provided to us. Um, yeah, and this additional extended functionality that we built around this, this, this core framework of parsing and having, having structured data uh, uh, might be something like uh, Jupyter Notebooks, right? So you can run Jupyter Notebooks, and then from within these notebooks, you can use our API to access the structured information and put it into your machine learning algorithms. Um, or it might be something here from the, from the experimental world, uh, uh, again, the example of a Nexus file. Um, where we have uh, uh, specialized viewers that are for this particular uh, type of data, uh, where you then can explore your HD5 files or something like this directly in our, in our browser. Or it might be tools like the electronic lab notebook uh, functionality um, that I showed in the previous uh, screenshot. Um, yeah, often we say people upload your data and then we have parsers for it. This is basically a different approach where we say, okay, uh, we don't have a parser for your information because it's like very custom to your workflow. Uh, but we allow you to describe your data, uh, and then you get these kind of forms that uh, then your lab workers can use to, to fill out, to describe your, uh, your experiment, and so on and so forth, which allows us to augment uh, this approach a little bit. Like some of the data might be uploaded and then passed, other, other information might be entered by humans, for example, through, uh, through a notebook like this. Yeah, this describes a little bit the... the, 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 the the functionality uh, of Nomad, and what we basically want to do with this, uh, with the Nomad software, uh, is to have this kind of workflow. Right? We want to allow people with the lowest uh, barrier possible to upload and share their data, uh, and then, uh, of course, the idea is that others can look at all the published data uh, and, and analyze it, and then this uh, will hopefully trigger the next round of research, uh, where again you will produce results that they are uh, that are uploaded and published. Uh, and then in the beginning, I said, we also have this other option where we allow institutes and research groups and individuals to run the Nomad software themselves. Um, this is what we call the, the Nomad Oasis. Uh, and the idea is, depending on your situation, you might not want to open in the public space all the time. You want to start in private 
or you have local instruments that you want to connect uh, 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 to your normative races or you have uh, data uh, in the beginning, you have lots of data that is just too large to publish it through the internet where you first need to analyze it and filter it down and, and, and so on and so forth. So there are different situations where you might want to say, okay, I want to manage my, my data locally. Uh, from the perspective of a group leader, this is like the, 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 the typical use case is, uh, and, and some of you might have uh, had this in the past, right? Uh, your PhD student is finished with his PhD, he left your department. Uh, and then you remember, oh, there was this one data set that he had that is very interesting that I need now, and then you can't find it. Uh, you go through old hard drives and old notebooks and, and, and try to figure it out. Uh, and this is where, where, where something normal can help, right? You, you just run this in your group. Uh, everybody is uh, uh, managing uh, the data within it, uh, and then you will never lose the data set again. Um, that's a little bit the idea. And then, of course, from your local races, uh, uh, in the future, we want to have a functionality that then allows you to actually take this information. Like once you are ready and say this can be published, and it should be, uh, there should be functionality that uh, uh, allows you to put this onto the onto the public nomad. Yeah. So at the moment, we are basically developing both things further. Uh, there is a few version of the nomad oasis that a couple of research institutes and partners are already using, uh, but it's still uh, a kind of work in progress. Uh, we spent the first year of Fermat, which was basically the last year. Uh, on making the OASIS useful to uh, the new branches of material science that we want to support. We want to make it useful, wanted to make it useful for uh, laboratories that deal with synthesis and experiments. Uh, and in the next year of Fermat, which is the year that we are now in, uh, we will focus more on this kind of federated approach uh, and, and connecting different installations of normal with each other and so on. So, yeah, I wanted to only spend half an hour on this topic and already spent 50, uh, 40 minutes on it. So let's jump to the next topic. Uh, I hope you got an idea about what Fermat is about, what Nomad is about, uh, and what you can do with the software. Um, now I want to go a little bit uh, more deeper uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a particular uh, topic of, uh, of data management, uh, which is data modeling. Uh, and before we start here, let's talk a little bit about models in general. Uh, because when we say data model, we mean a very different kind of model than the word model, how it was used in, in Lucas' uh, presentation, for example. Um, if you want to be very abstract, you, you can try to find uh, a, a definition for model. Like a possible definition could be a model is a purposeful abstract representation of something, which is not saying much, uh, but has a few key ingredients uh, that, 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 that I think are very important. First of all, there is a something that you want to model. Um, um, and then there's purposeful and abstract. Uh, abstract in the sense is that typically when you model something, you're not interested in the in in exact copy, you want to leave something out. Uh, there's, there's something that, you, that, you're not, uh, that you're not covering in your model. And purposeful is that the something that you model uh, is selected in a way that it follows a certain, uh, that it fulfills a certain, uh, a certain uh, application. Yeah. Um, a very typical example is like doing crash tests with cars. Uh, if you if you would really do a very very exact copy of reality, you will put real people in it. But of course, for the sake of your crash test, you don't want to do this. Uh, so you abstract away from the humans in the car, uh, and you try to represent them in a, in a different way. Let's say you put crash test dummies in there or something like this. Right? But the way how you abstract is very purposeful. You want to you want to get these kind of crash test data. So for example, you're not caring about the color of the car or something like this, right? So that, that, that's a model aspect that you, uh, that you can omit. So it's a little bit contradictory to, the, to this famous quote here uh, 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 where Norbert Wiener is saying the, the best model of a cat is another cat and preferably it's the same cat. Um, yeah, the, the idea of a model is to be something, something abstract uh, and abstract it in the sense that it's purposeful. Uh, and then talking about different types of model, uh, I think Luca was mostly talking about mathematical models. Um, I think you made the example of gravity, uh, of, of how Newton was devising the, the, the law of gravity, uh, uh, which is like a prime example for a, a, a mathematical model. Uh, then of course, there's, there's something like, like physical models, um, um, yeah, like the crash test, for example, or a model plane or model house or model bridge uh, or something like this. Uh, physical in the sense of that you get a tangible uh, model of something, uh, uh, something in reality. Uh, and the important uh, or the one important aspect, especially because it's like different from the last thing, uh, is that physical models are typically, you could say, uh, they, they are token models. They, they, 
the, the paper plane has two wings and the fuselage and the real plane also has two wings and the fuselage, right? So you, you take certain aspects of, of the thing in reality and they will also be, uh, be in your model. Or if you think about data, which often is this kind of token model, like if you think about like, as, let's say a, a photo camera of some sort, right? So you, you, you're doing a photograph, uh, light is hitting the sensor and then you're turning it into numbers. Uh, yeah, and uh, you have a number for each pixel, for example. So it's basically the light that was hitting this pixel that gets one number and then the light that was hitting the pixel next to it gets another number. So you, you have like these kind of token model uh, 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 property uh, that the different pieces of your model are representing different pieces in reality. Um, and this is different to the, to the last kind of model, the, the, the conceptual model. Um, the conceptual model is a little bit tougher to explain. Uh, it's, not, it's not that intuitive. A uh, conceptual model is where you basically form sets or categories uh, of things in reality, right? So you're not really interested in this one-to-one -to -one token relationship. Uh, it's more uh, that you want to say, okay, this, this group of students, uh, you, you conceptualize in the word student. Uh, there's this, this thing here from, uh, the, it's, it's called the semiotic uh, triangle that, that I think represents this, 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 uh, this, this rather, rather good. Uh, like this, this comes from linguistics or when you, when you, when you, when you, when you want to reason about how humans use symbols to communicate ideas and stuff like this, um, they use this triangle here. Uh, so basically the top of the triangle is uh, the, the idea, the thought, the reference in your head. Uh, and then when you talk to someone uh, about it, you use symbols, right? And at the same time, your ideas are typically about things uh, in, in, in reality. So if you want to talk about a cat, you might have the idea of a cat in mind. You might see the cat and then point to it and then say, this is a cat. So cat is your symbol, the, the word is your symbol. The, the actual cat is the, is the referent and the, the idea that you have of a cat uh, is, is what you have in mind. But these ideas are typically categories, right? You have one idea, but it represents infinite, infinitely many, many cats in reality. And these conceptual models are really important when we think about data models, because this is what data models typically are. They are uh, conceptual model models. So you can think of it in a way, the data typically is a kind of token model about reality. You have certain, certain data points that represent certain things in reality. Uh, but the model that you want to make about your, ta uh, about your data, um, this is more like a conceptual model. Uh, I will try to highlight this in, in, in the next slide where I want to talk about different uh, the different artifacts that are involved when you when you think about data models. Um, as I said, like modeling or, or, or data always starts in, in reality. So when we think about data, it's typically about something from real life. And uh, in, 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 yeah, in, in our sense, it might be this, the sample that you put under the microscope, or it might be the, 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 the structure that you want to simulate. Uh, there, there is something uh, that your data is describing. And then you have another layer. Uh, which then consists of the data itself. Um, and if you think about data, you often hear this distinguishing between metadata and data. Um, that's a very, some, often it's a, it's a very loose uh, 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 separation uh, of two things. Uh, the important part is both metadata and data, they are representing stuff in, real, uh, in reality. Like if you think about data, for example, the photo camera again, right? You have different uh, uh, numbers about the, the, the colors of your pixels. Um, or, yeah, and then you typically have numbers, you have matrices, you have these kind of things uh, when you think about data. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you also need information uh, that describes how the data was, was acquired, where it was acquired, who was acquiring it, when, what were the conditions, and so on and so forth. Uh, it might be about the type of instrument that you use, uh, the, 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 the thing that you, that, you, that you were trying to, to, to take a photograph from, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is what we typically refer to as, as metadata. Uh, additional data that is describing what the data is uh, or how it, was, uh, how it was acquired. And this is, again, this is uh, typically from, a, from the sense of a machine or from the sense of a uh, from, from, from the sense of how you might organize it in a computer, it's a very loose uh, uh, differentiation. It's, it's, more, it's more driven by application and, and by how, how humans see it. Uh, the computer typically doesn't really care whether it's data or metadata. It's, it's uh, uh, only something that we need to distinguish uh, to, to, uh, to organize it in our heads. So that's why they are here printed side by side on this on the same layer. They are both about things and, and, and reality. And then on the next layer, uh, this is then where the conceptual model comes in. Uh, this is this is this is where we have data schemas. 
where we basically want to describe possible data, where we want to describe uh, possible, uh, possible metadata. Uh, in the data schema, we might say, um, uh, 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 where we might say that the photographs that we take with our camera might contain information about the geolocation that this was taken in, right? The schema doesn't really tell you about the geolocation that a particular photo was taken in, but it tells you, okay, each photo has one field where you could put in the geolocation. <clears throat> and in this sense, it's a conceptual model, right? So it's the idea that there might be a, 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 a geolocation. And now I want to talk a little bit more about uh, these kind of schemas and, and what you need to do to, in, in order to write a schema or, or understand the schema. Um, yeah, this is a lot of text. Let me let me skip this. This is interesting. When you later 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 look at the look at these slides, let's jump directly into into an example. I, I hope that you can read this in, in, in the very back. For the people on Zoom, it's probably easy. Um, I try to make an example for, yeah, let's say it's a synthesis process of some kind. Um, so all these boxes represent concepts, right? Uh, they, they, they represent certain things that might happen during my synthesis experiment. Uh, it's starting with the experiment itself. So I, I basically say there is, uh, in, in reality, I might have something called experiment. Uh, then I define certain property uh, for uh, properties for my experiment. I say an experiment has a name. Uh, it has a certain date when it was when it was performed. Uh, it has a, it has a certain author that is like create, that is doing the experiment and it is the author of this uh, of the accompanying data, uh, for example. Uh, so you see uh, there's this concept of an experiment and then certain properties to it. And then we can create relationships between different concepts. So for example, here's another one: the the, the, the sample like this box is representing all the different samples that might be. Uh, might be part of my, uh, my, my experiments. And they say, okay, samples always have, have an ID. Uh, and then there's this relationship where, where I say experiments and samples are, uh, are connected. Uh, and uh, I use this particular arrow here that has this, 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 uh, that has this what is this shape called? This, this route, rhombus, whatever, uh, that has this uh, thing attached to it. Uh, and this thing is telling me uh, that I want my sample to be a part of the experiment, right? So it's a particular relationship where I want to say uh, samples are always parts of experiments. And the same is here about the, the, the processes and the measurements involved. Uh, I want to say an experiment consists of a sample, it consists of, of a process, or, and it consists of, of a measurement, or to be more exact, my experiment data consists uh, 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 consists of data that is about the sample, data that is about the pro uh, about processes, and data that's uh, uh, about uh, about measurements. Uh, and this part of relationship is later what creates these hierarchies. That right? when you think about hierarchies, it's always a, a parent child kind of relationship where where one piece of uh, uh, where one piece has exactly one. Uh, one parent. Uh, so later, when we when we look at data, uh, we look at the data about our sample. Uh, we can uh, there's always one experiment associated with it. Uh, and remember, this is just a model, right? You might model it differently depending on on what kind of processes you're thinking about, uh, what's happening in a laboratory. Uh, you might come up with a different model. Um, so I'm 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 not trying to make a point how you should structure experiments. I just want to make a point like how a conceptual model for for your lab work might look like. Um, yeah, and then there are, uh, uh, then you can continue on, right? You can have more, more, more of these concepts. And I just wanted to highlight that there are different types of relationships, right? So the relationship here that we have between sample and processes and, and, and experiment uh, is this uh, is this containment, is this parent of, is this uh, part of, whatever you want to call it. Uh, an experiment consists of these three different things. Uh, but then there are other relationships. For example, I might want to say uh, uh, I have uh, I have chemicals, uh, and instead of saying that my sample consists of chemicals, I might want to say my sample is just referencing chemicals. Uh, let, let, let's say I have um, I have a database of chemicals, and I, and I just want to want to express when I have a sample. Uh, I just want to say, okay, I took uh, chemicals from, from 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 this database, or I took chemicals from this uh, uh, cabinet, or whatever. When I was when I was uh, trying to 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 produce the example or describe the example, or whatever. Um, so this this arrow is a little bit different, right? It's not representing a, a, a composition. It's not representing a parent-child whatever relationship. It's just a general uh, uh, association between between the sample, uh, sample and the chemical. And then I wanted to introduce a, a third kind of relationship. 
Uh, here I say, okay, there is something like a, like a process, like, okay, there's something that I can do to my sample. Uh, it also has like a, let's say it has a duration and it has a point in time when it was, when it was performed. Uh, and then I say, okay, there's a, there's a specialized concept where I say, okay, I have a particular process now. It's, it's a different, uh, it's, a, it's a specialization of the original concept uh, where I say I have something like, I don't know, hot plate annealing, uh, uh, whatever this means, doesn't really matter. What this is expressing is, okay, I have something that is more special uh, than the original process. And the idea in these kind of uh, data models is that you typically are inheriting all the properties from, from, the, from, the, from the more general class, from the thing that you specialize, right? So the, the idea is that this hot plate annealing defines a natural, a, a different, a, another quantity. Let's say it says, okay, there's a temperature associated with it, uh, but it also inherits like the date and the duration uh, 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 from, from process, right? So if you have, data about how this process went, you might have a temperature, you might have a duration, and you might have a point in time. Yeah, the, the, the same here with measurements. Spectroscopy might be a particular kind of measurement that you are doing, uh, in, inheriting all the data points from the more general measurement. And with these kind of specializations, you can build like large hierarchies. Uh, um, and you can also, um, like if you, if you find a particular schema, uh, you can also specialize it further, right? Let's say, uh, your, your colleagues came up with a schema where they were defining this, what 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 a, what spectroscopy data should look like. Uh, you could take this and specialize it further because you are talking about a specific kind of spectroscopy uh, and, and and introducing more and more uh, quantities this, this way. Yeah, but the uh, the important thing is like these conceptual models. Uh, you define you define your concepts and then you define relationships between your concepts, right? Uh, and this is typically what a schema looks like. like this is, of course, take, this is very, very specific in its notation. Uh, this particular example here is what, what uh, is called UML class diagrams. Like UML is a modeling language. Uh, and this is what, what uh, these structural models look like in UML. Um, but we will later see there are different ways to define these kind of schemas. There are certain schema languages. You can program them in Python and then all these kind of things. <coughs> um, yeah. And then, of course, there is not one schema. There are multiple schemas, right? You can come up with, with, with tons of them. Uh, here's another example where we talk about uh, uh, composition in the sense of, okay, uh, composition is something that has a formula, and, and the composition is something that tells me uh, about something that is called concentrations. Um, and without knowing what it is, right? This is schemas are not necessarily telling you what, what something is. They are only saying something exists, has a certain name, and has a certain relationship to something else. Uh, all the meaning is just interpreted into us by humans uh, because we remember or we recall the names and, 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 and associate with something that we learned in school or whatnot. Um, yeah, consider this, we have compositions and they're consisting of, or the data about the composition consists of uh, data about elements. Um, and then you can, you, 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 get an, you get an idea, right? You're associating this with what you have learned about chemistry uh, and then the schema uh, 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 suddenly makes sense to you. And if you find the database and the database tells you, this is my schema, then you get an idea about what the information in this database might look like, right? Uh, then you expect that there are information about compositions in it and that it, for each composition, you will find a list of elements. And, and for each of these elements, you might find information about what the element label is, what the atomic number is, what the isotopes, possible isotopes are and, and so on and so forth. Like basically the information from a periodic table, for example. Uh, and then, of course, uh, different schemas can be uh, put into relationship uh, to each other, uh, and, and you can basically compose uh, different schemas. And then, yeah, like a possible extension would be that you connect your chemicals with, with a certain composition that defines what kind of elements are in this chemical and so on. <clears throat> okay, let's go one step more go in, 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 the, in the more technical direction. Uh, yeah, as I said, these kind of pictures, they are just a possible representation of, of, of schemas. Uh, eventually, when you, when you want to manage your data and put, them, put your data into tools and whatnot, you need to be more technical with your schemas and write them down, for example, in programming languages. Uh, this example that you see here on the, on the, on the, what is it, on the left, 
Um, this is how we write this down in Nomad, for example, but there are other ways of writing down schemas. Like if you think about XML schema or JSON schema or a LinkedML, there's tons of uh, schema languages and depending on what, what kind of database you're talking to or what, what kind of uh, system you're talking about, you might uh, have to use a different schema language. Um, but the, 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 the ideas behind it are typically, uh, typically very similar. Uh, here in Nomad, we have this way of writing schemas in Python where we define classes to, uh, to write down the concepts. Uh, like this example here uh, would be looking something like this. So for each of these concepts, we have a class, a class for element and the class for composition. Uh, and then within this class, we do, do define the, the, the various properties that are here uh, notated down. And then in Nomad, there's this particular way, this particular library where we get these things like quantity from uh, and this inherited class here from. Um, but basically we just use the Python syntax to find a way to describe, uh, to describe our schemas. And here you also then see the relationship to the data itself. Because you have Python classes, then the, the next step would be you can instantiate these classes, right? And then these instantiation, the objects for your classes, this would be your actual pieces of data. Um, and this is what, what I tried to show here on the, on the, on the other side, on the, on the right. Um, when you use these classes, you instantiate them. Let's say you create uh, uh, an instance of, uh, 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 of element. Um, let's go to the next slide here. We see this how it would look like in Python, right? Uh, so we take these classes and we create an instance of the composition class, for example, we in initialize the formula quantity with something like H2O, uh, and then we put it in the variable, call it water, uh, and then we add elements to it, right? We uh, add the information for hydrogen, we uh, add the information for oxygen, for example. Um, this is like how we practically could use uh, the, the schema that we have written down. Um, and then you could uh, uh, also uh, yeah, print out the data that you created like this, right? Uh, and then the print out would look like something like this. So we can turn it into this kind of JSON format where it then would exactly say the stuff uh, that, we, that we defined here. Um, and this is how, how Nomad does it internally, right? If someone uploads a calculation, for example, there are our parsers that go through the uploaded file, try to extract information. And these parsers are basically doing something like this. Uh, they take the Nomad schema, uh, where we predefined uh, what the calculation is, what the system is, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then they are just instantiating the schema uh, 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 and uh, producing data that looks like this. And the cool thing about this data here now, even though it looks just like a JSON record is, it tells you more than just the JSON record because it's associated to the schema. Uh, you, you, know, uh, you know that this is a composition and you know that these are elements. Uh, and then if you look at the schema, especially when the schema is a little bit more augmented with an English description, uh, with information about units and, and stuff like this. I think here, for example, here for, the, for the density, we did something like this, right? We said the density of an element is, is a floating point number, but for example, it has this unit attached to it, right? So there, there's more information to it uh, um, than what you would just read from this, from this JSON file, right? So if you know the schema, then you know that this is not just a number, it's a number that's supposed to be representing the, 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 uh, the density with a, with a certain uh, unit attached to it. Uh, and then we can also do unit conversions and all these kind of things with it. Okay, let me jump ahead and, uh, because of the time. Uh, let's go into Nomad one more time and look a little bit about the schema relationship uh, with the data uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a practical example. Um, so this is where we were before, right? This this this, this little browser here for calculations, uh, and if you if you look again at the uh, at the atomistic structure of our systems here, um, uh, I said that you typically represent a, a system in DFT calculations like this, where you have these lattice vectors and where you have positions and so on and so forth. Um, when you want to want to know more about these these quantities and what these numbers actually mean. Um, then you can look at the definition of it, or you can look at the, at the scheme of it. Uh, we have this, these buttons here that you can click, uh, where, where you then give uh, the, the, the English text that is, uh, that is put in our schema to describe what the, what the lattice vectors are. Uh, and you could also look at the schema definition itself. Uh, so this is where we define what the lattice vectors are, where we say, okay, there's a certain English text that describes what, what lattice ve uh, vectors is supposed to mean. But you would also see that the lattice vector uh, is basically floating point numbers in a particular shape as a three by three matrix, for example, uh, and then that, that there is the, a unit attached to it. 
Uh, and then this schema information is also used by by our by our uh, by our browser here uh, to represent this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the best possible sense. Like we are really showing this as a three by three matrix, uh, and then we also attach a unit to it, right? And here you see. Uh, that we can automatically convert between these units, like even though it's defined in meters, we are showing it in answerings, uh, depending on, on, on what you as a user want. So you can switch the unit systems and say, okay, I want to see this in, uh, in meters, or I want to see this in, in atomistic units or whatnot. Um, yeah, this is like one thing that you can do for the schema. But if you, uh, if you think about it in terms of uh, um, uh, machine learning and analysis, um, this is then the last part of the presentation. Uh, where we access this data and then we just get numbers, uh, we can use the schema information, for example, about the unit uh, to interpret the data correctly. Okay, let's go back to the, to the uh, presentation. And I think now we come to the last part. Yeah, let me skip this and let's jump to the last part. Um, where it's about working with APIs, particular to access data, right? Uh, to, to um, yeah, basically go in the programming world, uh, accessing database, uh, downloading data, and then putting them into, into machine learning models. Um, of course, I leave the machine learning model part to others, but we will focus on accessing the data and downloading it. Um, and this is done with APIs. So I want to talk a little bit about APIs, what they are, how they work first. Uh, and then give you some practical examples based on, on NOMAD on, on how to access some data. Um, so API in general, the, what, the, what the term means is application programming interface. And, and in a very general sense, it basically uh, is, is just describing the, yeah, well, it's, a, it's an interface, a contract, uh, how different software components uh, might communicate with each other. And when we in our modern world talk about APIs, we're typically referring to web services and APIs on the internet, uh, which most often follow this, uh, this REST kind of flavor. Uh, so they, they are typically called RESTful APIs. But in the end, it's about uh, two software components talking to each other, right? And in, in terms of the internet, it's typically as a client talking to a server. Um, yeah, so in, and uh, if you look at these RESTful APIs a little bit closer, what this REST means or what, what, the, what the acronym is meaning is representation is state transfer. Um, and uh, yeah, what, what, what is this REST? Is it important? Uh, I don't know, but just as a piece of background knowledge, uh, it's basically the ar architectural style uh, behind uh, how, how lots of modern web services uh, uh, are working. Uh, and the idea in, in representation and state transfer is that the application state is represented as resources that are transferred throughout the internet, right? You, you can think about this in terms of, I don't know, uh, I, I used to use Twitter as an example, it's not that popular anymore, but let, let, let's keep this with, with uh, Twitter as an example. Um, you have your Twitter timeline uh, and all the different messages in your timeline, right? They are basically uh, constructed as resources on the internet, and then you can ask for them. You can say, uh, give me this particular tweet. Looking at the tweet, you can say, give me all the tweets that follow this hashtag, and so on and so forth. You're basically uh, 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 breaking down your application into resources, into, into little documents, and then you can do something with these documents. You can get them, you can post them, uh, you can delete them, um, these kind of things. But this is the, the typical uh, uh, REST approach. Uh, so it's all about uh, executing very simple operations uh, on, on resources. Uh, the protocol that is typically used behind this is, is HTTP, like the, the internet protocol, the application layer protocol, uh, which just provides you with very simple things like get, delete, post, put, like these kind of operations. And then you perform them on resources and to, 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 to detail what kind of resources you want to manipulate, you use URLs, uh, like URL, uh, uh, uniform resource locator. I think this is what the, what the term means. Uh, and then the documents themselves typically use something like JSON uh, to, to represent information. Um, yeah, we will look at this in, 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 in practical examples. I think that makes, that makes more, more sense. Um, but the important part is, um, yeah, it's this very basic model. Uh, and the, why it is so popular is, uh, yeah, when you look at what, what is happening before REST, if you look at the internet of the 2000s of the dot-com bubble and whatnot, uh, there was always that the, the, the state, the application state uh, needed to be a uh, uh, hold on the, on the, on the server. Uh, the server basically had to know that you were going through your timeline and had to remember for you that you were at this particular point in the timeline. 
Uh, and with modern REST, this is all hold in the client. So your, your app on the phone knows where you are in the timeline. So the server doesn't really have to remember. Uh, and this makes this very, very scalable. Uh, so you can scroll through your timeline and one request to the timeline goes towards America and the other request goes to a server on, on, in Europe or whatnot. And it doesn't really matter. Uh, and in the old internet, you always had to talk to the same server, which at some point wasn't scalable anymore. And yeah, this is why this became so popular with Facebook, Twitter, and all the social media things that were coming up in the in the mid uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Here's the, again the picture. Um, it's it's very simple. You have these very simple operations to get information, to put information. The information itself is represented in some kind of structural format, like JSON, for example. Um, and then your API is simply storing, manipulating uh, a, a database. Uh, and this is the only thing that the server needs to know, right? It doesn't, it it's, can be very, very dumb. It's just about putting something in the database, reading something from the database. And this is what makes it so scalable. Um, yeah, a little bit uh, about the, 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 the necessary tools uh, to do REST APIs. Uh, as I said, HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol, the, the, the primary application layer, uh, a kind of networking protocol of the internet. Uh, this is what your browser uses to, to get your pages and showing them to you. Um, a very simple protocol to get and manipulate resources on the internet. And then these resources identified through URLs. Uh, you probably know what URLs are. You have used them in the past, for example, in your browser. Uh, and yeah, and you will also use them in, in APIs. Um, I think the important part about the URLs is think a little bit about its structure. Um, so URLs typically come with a, with a protocol in the beginning, right? This is where you see this HTTP, for example. Uh, and then they, they are addressing a certain location in the internet, typically a server, a computer of some kind. Uh, and then they have a, a pass component that, that uh, uh, yeah, basically tells you what part of the server you're interested in. Uh, and then optionally, there might be a, a query string, a set of parameters that is further detailing what kind of resource you're interested in. Yeah, when you want to use APIs, you, you, have to, you have to think about the parse and the query parameters quite a lot. So it's, it's kind of important to know what they are. Um, yeah, here's an example. Um, uh, this is the Google Docs URL that will send you to this uh, uh, presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, and you see, okay, it's, it's obviously on some kind of server that is, that is owned by Google. Uh, there's a pass to it, which is basically this whole part here. And then at the very end, there's this kind of small query string um, where you're never really sure, do I need to copy this when I share this with people or does it, <laughs> does it matter? I don't know, whatever. But this is, this is what URLs look like. And then there's the, 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 the JSON, the JavaScript object notation that we typically, that REST API is typically used to represent uh, 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 information. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. If you're not familiar with it, um, you will just learn it on the fly. It's nothing special about it. It's just this kind of way of, do I have an example? Oh, I have an example for, for, for uh, uh, JSON. It's just a way of taking dictionary data and arrays and, and, and making them uh, a, a larger data structure. So typically in JSON, you have these kind of objects and in your objects, you have keys and then the keys can, and can either be data or they can be other objects or they can be arrays. Uh, it's, when you're used to Python and Python dictionaries and Python lists, you're, you're usually quite familiar with this. Okay, um, yeah, let, let's get a little bit more practical. What, what, uh, how do we start? How, how do I get started with, with, with APIs? Uh, there are certain tools that you can use uh, to use APIs. Uh, the simplest tool, I guess, is the browser. Uh, so the browser is basically an HTTP machine. Uh, so you can use it uh, uh, to, 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 to access APIs, especially doing gets. This is what your browser is doing when you're typing something in the UL bar. Uh, it's, 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 uh, executing a get operation on this particular URL and it's showing you the result. Um, so you can use your browser to, to, to uh, go to certain get API endpoints. And then there are particular tools like on the command line, you use curl or wget. And then of course on Python, you have certain libraries that you can use to, to perform HTTP uh, operations. Uh, and then very often you also have API specific libraries or something like this. So for example, for Nomad, there's a, there's a Python package called Nomad Lab that you can use to make it a little bit easier to talk to our API. Okay, let's, let's, do, let's do a few examples here. Let me, let me I, I told you, you can use your browser. Um, let's, let's try this. Um, so on, on our Nomad, we have this kind of API section here, which looks like this. This gives you a little bit of help. Uh, it has our, our, our API dashboard. Uh, I can go here, though this is basically a description of the Nomad API. 
uh, and other APIs have very similar things. Like if you if you go to Twitter and you pretend to be a Twitter developer, they will show you something very similar uh, that explains you how to can read your time, uh, the, the Twitter time and whatnot. Uh, in Nomad, it looks like this. Uh, it shows you different API endpoints, so different paths, different uh, uh, resources that you might use. Uh, for example, you might be interested in, I don't know, in, in the Nomad entries, you want to perform a search or something like this. Um, yeah, let, 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 let's try this search entries and retrieve their metadata. Let's say that that sounds interesting to us. We want to do something like this. Uh, we can uh, unfold it uh, and then we see what kind of parameters go into this, into this operation. Um, uh, we can ask a query of some kind and whatnot. It's typically very technical uh, and initially it might be quite daunting to get into this. Uh, so we try to make it a little bit simpler um, by also putting hints into our UI. Uh, so if you if you go to our uh, to our where was it if you go to our um, search API for example and you have a search like this what we had before we have this little button here uh, which tells you a little bit about how to construct your uh, uh, how to construct your <clears throat> your API calls and, and whatnot so if you don't know all the parameters and stuff like this you can use this uh, uh, as a kind of help to construct uh, a, a search. So, but uh, we, we wanted to start simple. Let, let's go back. Uh, let's say we don't do any parameters. We, we don't care. We just want to want to get started, right? We just want to see results. We can press this tryout button here. Uh, we skip all the parameters. We just use the defaults. We don't care. Uh, and we, we press the execute button. Um, and then this, the dashboard is basically performing uh, uh, this HTTP uh, kind of get operation. Uh, and then we see the results here, right? Uh, so the, this is the, the, the most simple way that you can do to use the API. It was basically just using this URL, uh, sending it to our server, and then it's printing the results here. And you can do this directly in the browser, right? So I can copy this URL. I can go to a new tab and just, um, oh, I, of course, I have to I have to see my browser bar. OK, and then you can just uh, paste the URL in there, and, and you can execute it. Uh, and of course, you don't see a web page as a result, but you see some pieces of data uh, uh, as a result, right? Uh, so that, that's the very it's a, that's a very basic uh, API operation. Um, so what we were doing is we were using our our entries endpoint, which gives you access to all the entries on Nomad, uh, and then you get a result like this, right? Uh, it tells you there are twelve million kind of entries of this kind. Um, gives you some information about what page of data it's currently giving to you. So it tells you, okay, I give you 10 elements, I give you 10 entries, but there's a total of 12 million, right? And then here in the data thing, we have the first 10 that it, that it gave, us, gave to us. Like if I, if I fold them all, you will see there are exactly 10 of them. So it's not giving you the 12 million all at once, right? So you have to do something to get, uh, to get more and more and more, which is a very typical property of these kind of REST APIs, right? Uh, the same with Twitter. When you say Twitter, give me my timeline, it's not giving you the whole timeline. It's only giving you the last 10 entries or something like this. Um, yeah, and then you can have a look at the entries themselves. Uh, and then you can see all the, all the information that we are providing. Uh, so for example, there's something about the uh, simulated material. There's something about the elements in it. There's something about the symmetry uh, and so on and so forth. And what you see here then depends on our schema, right? So if you want to understand the result and you want to know what is this, what is this point group kind of thing, I have no idea. Uh, then you can go to our schema and try to learn uh, uh, something, uh, something about it. But let's say you are smart and we use sensible names for everything, so you get some idea what this is, what is, what this is doing. Um, then you, okay, uh, for example, you can get the elements here that are associated with this particular, uh, with this particular entry. Yeah, this is one way of doing it. Uh, I think you can imagine how to use curl for something like this, right? You, you just use curl and then you also uh, present the URL and then you get a similar result uh, in, in, in your shell. Uh, I think the, the, the next more interesting stuff is to use an actual programming environment to use something like Python to do your, to do your uh, API work. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. Uh, and if you look at a, few, uh, at a few Python examples, and then these are also the kind of examples that you can later try on in the in the practical session of this uh, of this afternoon. Um, yeah, I think this this we just saw in the. Uh, I, I tried to do a very very similar example to what we just saw in the in the in the browser, but now it's it's Python. Um, and in Python, 
there's lots of HTTP libraries. I think the most popular one is the request library. So we start by importing the request library. We need to work with JSON, so importing JSON is also always a good idea. Um, and then we start using the request library. So in, what, what are we doing here? Uh, we, are saving, uh, we are saving a base URL. Uh, this is like the, where, where the Nomad API starts. We just keep it as an extra variable so that we don't always have to type out the whole thing. Um, and then we start using request library, right? Uh, we issue, this time we issue a post uh, uh, post operation uh, towards this endpoint here. So we have a, a Nomad, we have an entries endpoint and that has a, a resource query that you can post to. So you can post your queries uh, and then it will give you the query results. Um, and the request is very easy. When you want to post something, you can post the document. You can just give the JSON and this Python dictionary kind of format here. Uh, so we are posting uh, a query. And this is what you see here is exactly what you could have copied from the user interface. Like if you enter titanium oxygen and then you look at the API button, you will get a snippet that you can just copy paste here. Um, yeah, and then this snippet basically contains our query, right? It says, okay, there's a query. I want to query the, the material elements uh, uh, and I want it that, uh, that all these kind of things are contained in there. So I'm interested in the, in the entries where this area of elements contains titanium and oxygen. And then I can say something about the pages that I want to have because we are, we are, we are asking for, for these potential millions of, of, of calculations. I can say, okay, I'm interested uh, in the first page and the page should be containing exactly one element. So we will only get the first uh, results. You can also put a 10 in there, then you get the 10 first results. Uh, you can also put a 12 million in there and then you will get an error that tells you you can't ask for so much at the same time. And then we will see later how to solve this problem. Um, yeah, but this is this is all that's to it. This is how you do HTTP with Python. Uh, then you can initiate the respond uh, the, the 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 request. Uh, uh, well, you can here is where we do the request, and then you can have a look at the response uh, and say, I want to see the response as a JSON document, and then we just print it out, and then you get something like this, which looks very similar to what we just saw in the browser. <coughs> yeah. Uh, it's a little bit simpler than what we saw in the browser because of these parameters that we set with it, right? First was the query parameter, and then we said we only want to have one element, so our data section only contains one, one entry. And we also said that we are interested in a particular information. We only want to have the entry ID, so it only gives us the entry ID. Um, it's it's uh, yeah, just to make it a little bit smaller here for the uh, for the for the presentation. Um, maybe a few words on, on pagination because this is typically very important when you want to download larger data sets, you somehow have to deal with this, with this page problem, like the API is only giving you a, a certain amount of things at the same time, but you want to have a lot. So you have to use lots of requests, right? You say, give me the first page, then give me the second page, then give me the third page, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and they are typical, depending on the, the API, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, what we do in Nomad, we provide the next page after value. Uh, so we basically say, when, if you want to have the next page, you are interested in all entries that have this value larger than this. So when we think about the entry ID, uh, this is basically the entry ID of the last thing that we returned. Uh, and if the next, uh, if we do the next uh, query um, with, uh, oh, I already put it in algorithm, but but imagine, yeah, okay, let, let's, let's try to explain this. Um, so we basically do the same thing as before. Uh, we have our base URL here. We have our, our typical JSON body. So we're not changing much. It's the only thing is like, now I want to have a page size of 10. Uh, otherwise, it's the same. But now, instead of just asking for this once, we are doing a loop, right? So we, are, uh, uh, we do a while thingy. Uh, I keep here my result set. I want to collect formulas. Uh, and I say, unless I have more than 100 formulas, I want you to continue. So I'm asking for, for this resource once. So I, I'm putting here in my post, uh, I get a response. Uh, then I look at the response. I try to extract the formulas and put them into my formula set. Uh, and then I'm interested in this pagination kind of thing. So I look at the response uh, and I look at the pagination object of the response and I'm trying to get this next page after value thing. And then this next page after value, I put into, the, into my request, into this thing here. Uh, I put it here into the pagination object. I put it here into the pagination object as page after value. Uh, uh, and then the loop continues. So with the next request, we are sending the after value visit, right? And then we get all the things, the next page that is after this value. And then the next time we use the next, next after value and so on. And then the next, 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 next after value and so on and so forth. 
and, and therefore we always get get new pages. We always get the uh, get the next page, and once we have more than hundred, the loop will stop. Or if there is no next after value because we already exhausted our, our query before we reach one hundred formulas, uh, we also stop, and then we just print out the formulas. Um, yeah, this is this is how pagination pagination works. I thought I had no, I didn't. Okay. Um, Okay, what else? Do we do want to do something else or should I stop? What do you think about the time table? Do you want to drink coffee? Right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, I, I, I briefly introduced to the, this to you if you're interested uh, in the, in the, in the hands-on kind of thing. So let's skip it for now. But this is basically explaining you how you could use our Nomad uh, 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 Python package to do lots of the query work for you. For example, if you don't want to program the pagination uh, yourself, there's basically a library uh, particular for the Nomad API that would help you with this. Okay, then let's do some uh, some conclusions. So I broke down my talk into this, this, these four kind of things. I try to convince you that uh, research data management is important, uh, not just for you, but also for your institute and the whole community. Um, you can use tools like Nomad to help you with, with your data management needs. Uh, and we looked a little bit into data modeling and we looked into how you can use APIs to access data. Um, later on in the tutorial session, uh, you will get a URL to this presentation and then there's lots of links into further tutorials into to normal to our documentation and whatnot. Okay, that's it for, for now and for me. Thank you. Yeah.